Okay, we are now recording. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, and if we have those that are international, good evening. Uh, we are now having our first virtual interim session for the SKIM working group. Uh, the first one of the year. <laughs> so I didn't get many responses either in the Slack channel or in the mailer. Um, but I figured there's still plenty of stuff for us to discuss, but because this is a, 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 a virtual interim session, um, I should go through the note well, because we are following the IETF procedures and hopefully everybody should be, I'm trying to look at the list of participants, um, should be familiar with the IETF policies and the note well. Um, basically, it's the notion of um, the activities here, especially since we're recording the session. Um, we have a privacy statement in place and um, then uh, with respect to the best common practices, there's the whole list of how we conduct our, our sessions. And I, I didn't put the, the reminder that I did last time in the code of conduct, but I mean, I, I think we're a pretty well behaved group. Um, with that, we can move forward. We are still in search of a co-chair so that you guys don't have to suffer with just having me. Um, and I'm hoping Roman will have someone by the March timeframe. Um, thank you, Janelle, and others should jump in. The hedge dog, which used to be Cody MD, um, is the tool that the IETF uses. Um, it allows me to just set something up quickly so that I can post them as well um, through the IETF process. So, lacking any explicit solicitation of, of points of discussion, I know that we need to move forward in our charter. We know that we needed to update, um, not needed, we need to update the use cases um, as well as the schema and the protocol. In the IETF 112 session, um, we had volunteers to step up to be editor for these pieces of work. So I wanted to get a pulse and um, get an update of where we are with that body of work. Um, so Janelle, since I'm the only chair, I'm gonna leave it to you to raise some of the things that we discussed with Elliot vis-a-vis -vis the use cases. Um, but I was gonna open it up and see if there was any other agenda bashing before we, we get to the, the updates. Sounds good. Yeah. Everybody okay with this? Any other topics? I think we have one more topic, which is to discuss the agenda for the IETF in person or not interim meeting, the big meeting. Yes, and actually my deadline um, to request for a session. So if we can take five minutes on, on that now for you guys to think about. Um, my deadline is on Friday to request for a session. My thought was that perhaps we only need one two hour session. Um, but if there are folks here that believe we need more time. I doubt that we need less time, uh, especially since we're just getting started. You you should let me know. But I plan to uh, put the session request in probably by tomorrow. So, so at the end, we, we can talk about um, what we want to do vis-a-vis -vis the agenda for that. Excuse me, Nancy. Yes. 
Just one question. Uh, does anybody actually plan to attend in person? So, when I did the survey, um, everybody who responded thus far said they were planning on being remote. I'm admittedly on the fence. Thanks. Yeah, so no, not everybody responded. I want to say a handful of folks responded, um, but all of the responses were remote. So I'm glad you joined. Elliot. I had planned to be there. This is Pam. I oh, haven't responded to, to the survey. Well, I mean, assuming there's a there to go to. <laughs> oh, there there is. So the registration, and in fact. Um, the registration opened a couple of days ago, and so for ITF 113, it's a hybrid. And so there is the, um, ability for you to attend live. Uh, it will be in Vienna. And I forget the dates. It's, I want to say the 3rd week in March. I thought it was the 21st to the 26th, but let me just look. It's That's March 19 to 25th. There we go. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, Pam, you're thinking you might attend live? Yeah, that was my plan, but, you know, mostly to meet you all. <laughs> so, if, you know, if most folks are going virtual, then I'll play it by ear. Well, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence because, um, another group that I chair. There's, there's not quite half, but a fair amount of participants that are planning on live. <laughs> Elliot, do you have any plans? Um, not yet. It will depend on a couple of factors, but my. Preference would be not to go at this time. Yeah. All right. Um, let's just move on to uh, the the updates and discussions on where we are. Let's start with the use cases. And I think Pam, you volunteered to take the pen for that draft. I did, and I have nothing to show for it. At this time, <laughs> however, I will for uh, next month. So. I will double down on this and make sure I get something. That we can debate um, in the next, you know, 4 to 6 days. So, I'm hoping we can use our time. Maybe this time next week to review if folks have time. And I'll, I'll put it up on slack 1st, so that people can see it. Um, and then Danny and Janelle, you all, you both had volunteered as well. So. I would send an advanced draft to you to make sure you can add pieces. Does that make sense? If, if we can talk about it today, like, if we have time in this hour. I'd love to use that extra time as well. We, we do. I mean, so, um, let's see if I were to split the time. We could spend the next 20 minutes on the use cases. And then, um, the rest of the time on the scheme and the protocol. Yeah, maybe we should flip it to do the scheme and protocol first. Is that then? You, okay, I'm, I'm just thinking if that if that conversation was sort of planned and already ready, then. That makes sense, um, probably not a whole lot more than yours. No, no not a whole lot more. Um, yeah, Danny and I have been meeting. Um, we do have a plan to go through the outline of of the targeted items. To that were addressed in the last meeting, such as going through the paper cuts, looking at the schema, uh, what parts of the schema need to be removed that were not being used uh, or not in use. So we will do that too. And I think we need to follow a similar cadence, Pam, with uh, a weekly. Danny and I met prior to this meeting to discuss uh, our plans going forward. 
for the schema as well. And, um, let's see. My my next question would be whether there's and this is more logistic. So perhaps we'll leave the last five minutes um, of this session to discuss um, whether we need to have whether we want to have another virtual just prior to the um, ITF 113, which we can since we said that we would have a cadence of every four weeks, um, and then set that staging and planning for IETF 113. So given that, that scheme and protocol are not as, I mean, are equally as far along, Pam, why don't we just continue discussions on, on the use cases? Um, so Elliot, right, I wasn't sure whether you would join. I, I figured this would be a good time for you and Janelle to speak to some of the things that we had talked about since I'm chair, I, I can't speak to them. Um, yeah, uh, why doesn't Janelle start and then I'll continue? How about that? I don't have anything to discuss. I I would love to discuss. I think maybe Elliot and I need to, to go away and talk to each other about okay. uh, what we need to discuss regarding. So we're supposed to be getting together to discuss the plans for the use cases. Is that the action? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So let's let's do that and then I can and then Pam and I can also get together and discuss that as well. How about that? Does that work for everybody? Okay. Does that work for you, Pam? I'm volunteering you. <laughs> of course, absolutely. Um I so I have a couple of proposals proposals specifically related to 7642 that I'd, that I'd like to ask the group about. Um but it's more about what we don't want in 7642. You know, and then what we, what do we want in seventy six forty two? So it's very specific. Is that is that something we can do now, or do you want to wait? No, this this is this is the right time. So um, just to be clear, Pam, you're going to put another document together, and it will be the update, right? So it's it's basically a a, a whole new document that updates. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's my understanding. And that um, that Janelle and Danny and myself and it sounds like probably Elliot, right? In conjunction with the use cases, uh, we'll all, you know, we're going to find a, pl a place to meet in the next week. Yeah. Um, to I, look at what that document would be. Yeah, I, Elliot's in Europe, right? Elliot, Am I right on that. Correct. And and also just to to say that. Uh, once Janelle and I, uh, you know, the, the lovely thing about the IETF is that it's a great way for Cisco to coordinate, you know, to actually meet people who work at Cisco and thus we can learn that we actually have to coordinate with each other. So, um, uh, Pamela, uh, uh, Janelle and I have a little bit of, of talking to do first and then she can represent me if the time zone is uh, unreasonable. For yeah. Yeah, just to introduce uh, Elliot, he's part of our devices team, and he's particularly interested in skim use cases regarding devices. And uh, just a moment before this meeting, Danny and I were discussing how there's an interest within our device group in and using skim and expanding on skim uh, for device use cases. So, and it's really interesting. I, given my identity with a person background to be thinking of devices in the skim context. Um, so, so that's where Elliot comes into play. And I think it'd be interesting to bring us together with you, Pam, to look at the, the shape of those things in the context of the use cases, if we could find some time with you. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, so do, okay. do we want to do a bit of question and answer about 7642 now? Or do we want to do the schema protocol piece first? We we should spend another um, 10, 15 minutes on uh, your Q&A for 7642, just to give you some guidance, right? Okay. Um, so, so I've got a, uh, a couple of, based on the output from our last ITF uh, buff before we chartered. Um, I have a set of statements that I think can and should be true about 7642 that I, I need your feedback 
all of you as a group. So if it's all right, I'm, I'm going to make statements <laughs> and you all can evaluate them as to whether they are full of beans or whether they are um, acceptable in your opinions as, as a way to transform um, RFC 7642. For anyone who hasn't seen it, so if you go to datatracker.ietf.org slash doc slash RFC 7642, you will find a document which is our use cases and concepts document which we are looking to replace. And uh, so part of the um, argument for replacing this document is that uh, it doesn't, it was written sort of early in the standardization process last time. And some of the concepts that ended up in the final version of the schema and protocol are not in the use cases and concepts um, document. Uh, so, and then the other argument is that in fact, people's usage of cloud platforms in general and skim specifically matured uh, since this document was written as well. And so there are concepts that are not in this document that we think should be. So hopefully that's enough of a kind of a grounding as to where we, uh, where we should go. So uh, the first statement that I think is true is that section three of this document uh, which is skim use cases um, doesn't actually list sort of the most exciting use cases for skim. So right now the use cases in uh, in the concepts use cases and concepts document include migration of identities, single sign-on, provisioning of user accounts for a community of interest, transfer of attributes to a relying parties website, um, and that's it. Those four things. So, from my perspective, section 3.4, transfer of attributes to a relying party's website, I believe that is sort of the most common use of skim today. Would anyone disagree with that? Okay. Um, Can you repeat that, Pam? Yeah, the, the section is called transfer of attributes to a relying party's website. So it is essentially loose provisioning, right? Yep. Yeah, uh, one, one comment, I'm not sure I, I ever liked that characterization because I, I think there's two parts to it. Um, one is, um, or maybe three, transfer of life cycle um oh. transfer of attributes and then transfer of entitlements um they're all three can be the same but they're all three can be different in other words uh if you're an enterprise you want to make sure that access is granted on time and but also for billing reasons, when that person departs, you want to deprovision that account and suspend right. or delete. You know, there's, so there's the the workflows for each are slightly different. And, and then there's the, the case that I think that was originally envisioned to share the telephone number. Um, underlying all this too is, you know, we may need to open the door, or resurvey is the notion of the skim just a provisioning API, because that sort of comes up all the time and becomes important for scoping purposes, or are people tending to use it more as a database? Um, that's questions people have. Well, if I put up skim, then can I use it for authentication on behind my OAuth server and things like that? Not everybody's okay. going to be doing that. Uh, uh, not everybody's capable of doing that, but. Uh, um, that brings up the issue of uh, access control and things like that. Yeah, just to build on Phil's comment there, one of the challenges I've had in trying to look at the skim PAM uh, drop spec and figure out how we can incorporate parts of that into the core spec is that at its heart, the skim PAM spec is really an entitlement management spec. Um, and so <laughs> the question then becomes, do we want to expand uh, skim's core spec to also include the ability to manage arbitrary entitlements? Uh, which I think would be enormously useful in the industry, 
uh, but it's a, a question back to purpose, back to Phil's question of purpose of whether that's whether that's an acceptable or, or desirable thing to add to, to skim uh, to the force back. I also know there's lots of people using skim as a JSON document data engine protocol um, where they're they're defining IoT things. They're not just provisioning users anymore. They're provisioning uh, devices, all sorts of other things because of the schema format being extensible and definable. Um, there's there's a plethora of JSON schemas now emerging for different reasons and um, it just keeps coming up. So I'm not sure it's appropriate necessarily to restrict it to users and groups in our languages or the use cases. It might be just to step back and say, um, I don't think we're gonna change our intent because that's that's what we have to achieve. But I wouldn't want to close the door on other things that people want to use it for either. Um, just because uh, it hasn't been done and I know even. I know there are SQL teams that have started using the JSON. Filtering language for JSON documents. Because it solves certain problems in complex nested structures. Um, so. Um, would it be reasonable then to have a use case that's not just users and attributes and entitlements? Yeah, it's kind of shocking that there is no extension example here. So I think the you know the question we don't have to answer today it might be that once it, you read it through, it'll become obvious. But if if one of the use cases is a skim object extension, I think that makes sense. And then the question becomes, are we better off? Do we give an example of object extension or do we literally give a, the actual use case of managing devices or the actual, you know, so is it an oblique reference to object to an extension that manages a new object or should we be more explicit in calling it out that it, that that's, you know, that that itself is the use case. I don't know if we, um, if I can get in there uh, for a moment, I, I think Pamela, you're, your, your point is very well taken and um, I think Phil, your comment as well. Um, two points. First, I'm here mostly because there's a need for us to provision devices. And so we'll be, you know, Janelle and I will be talking and then we'll, we'll, we'll show you more what we have in mind. Um, and so, you know, from, from that perspective, you know, one of the questions that we're going to want to look at is how do devices relate to groups? How do we do, how we do how do we do grouping? How do devices relate to users? Because they do. Um, what uh, you know? What sort of scope for this group? The more you know, if if we get away from provisioning, if we get away from CRUD operations too far, like you you risk really bloating the scope quite a lot. On the other hand, um, and, and what we have is, is, is really, you know, we're gonna find this challenging enough. So I, I just, just a caution on that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think yeah. for the use cases, we can be fairly simplistic, right? Sorry, Janelle, I, I didn't mean to talk yeah. about I, I, I think. I was it, Sorry, I was just going to comment that I don't know if it's a an issue we could address in a best practice, but there's a lot of confusion about the legitimacy of defining new schemas and and whether they have to go to the work group. So a lot of people are confused. This is an IANA IETF issue more than it is a skim issue. A number of people keep saying, "Well, am I even allowed to use skim for other things?" Because because 7643 only defines users and groups and they think the world's gonna end if they do something and don't register it. And then there's the issue of, and I said, well, you don't even have to go to the ITF if you wanna do a specifically purpose thing. If it's important in your industry to do that, there's an IANA process that's much simpler. You just define it and register it with IANA. Somebody will review it for conflicts and that's pretty much it. Um, and but there's a lot of people that 
that hump is huge in the in the industry and as as that sort of worries me more um and so it, it maybe it would help to have another group define a device spec for something and just register it almost outside the working group process i don't know elliot if that is is appropriate for you guys but um you know from a I, I guess when we start talking about devices, so the the provisioning that we're talking about might be different than the provisioning that other people are talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where you begin to think, oh, you know, maybe it's not so easy to standardize all of this, um, but maybe it's also a matter of, of table normalization, if you will. Um, in terms of what is what are the core attributes of a device, and there may only be like two, three, four, and then everything else is a schema extension. Um, it could be that we want to do something a little differently, and and talk in terms of capabilities or things like that. But I don't think we're there yet. I think it's a good time to have the conversation, though. Right? We're just we're, you know, probably we're we're weeks away from it. Is this something that you would want to have in, interoperate with other devices, or is this something private to your devices? Um, I think it has to reflect the nature of the device. Let me give you two examples. Um, suppose what we're talking about is providing um, onboarding information about the device, say, it, for in order to do a, 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 a mutual proof that the, the this the, this this element is authorized to own uh, authorized to communicate with this device and this device is authorized to communicate with with this element some of that needs to be provisioned for headless devices and not like you can type passwords into a light bulb right and so um but the mechanism to do that will vary more based on uh, 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 will vary based on many different things right and and it, the, the algorithms to do that are, are pretty well known. They're probably just a handful of those, right? But how they're implemented at, in, in the underlying technology, if we're talking about Bluetooth, Bluetooth has means to do this. If we're talking about uh, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi has means to do this. We're talking about Zigbee, Zigbee has means to do this, but they're all similar, but slightly different. And so um, some of that has to be kinked out. Uh, yeah, I think I'll just state my opinion. Um, my opinion is that devices are very widespread um, and, and many manufacturers make them. And, you know, we can all do things slightly differently, but they all have these commonalities. And so to me, it makes sense to look to, to is there a standard to be developed for uh, registering device to general, like be shared across the industry so that we can achieve interoperability because Often the devices do not live one and one to themselves. We all have these heterogeneous things. We don't just all buy one manufacturer of advice. So that's that's why I lend support to thinking of this in a in a standardized process and bringing the industry together to determine what that standard looks like. So is the plan for for you to bring something to the group for us to look at? Yep. Okay, sweet. That's my plan. Elliot, I hope you're on board. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. Uh, we're not, look, uh, from my perspective, I'm not in a tearing rush, right? We've, let's, let's take the time. We've got experts on this call. Phil and I haven't seen each other in a while, right? Phil, I remember when Morteza and you and, and a couple others started to kick this thing off. But we got the experts here who can do the review, like Phil, right? Like Janelle, like um, you know, we have many experts on the call. And as long as we can just take our time, step through it, get it right. You know, I don't want to delay too long, but 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 we have time to get this right. I think. Yeah, I think it also brings um, a new life to the standard. Um, we've always been focusing on the standard, at least mostly in the realm of users and, and user identities. But there is a huge interesting future out there in, in um, IoT and devices, which would be a very 
uh, interesting future for skim. You know, even beginning to think like uh, Elliot mentioned devices in groups, you know, what does that mean? Um, some in, uh, practitioners in the identity, Microsoft being one of them types, their types of groups already. They have uh, policy type groups. They have distribution type groups and other things. Would we have a device type group? Would we have a heterogeneous group that's filled with devices and users? Uh, these are the types of questions that come into play when we begin to think about skim beyond human identities. Anyway, you can see I'm very excited on this topic. <laughs> uh, okay, are we talking about that again later or is, I just wanna make sure that topic gets. It, it sounds like it's gonna come back um, in the form of a proposal from Janelle and Elliot. That's what I'm concluding. I'm also gonna be timekeeper and do a time check um, Janelle and Danny, I'm presuming you're also going to need 15, 20 minutes to do any discussion. Um, I would not mind it. Okay. If that's the case, then, um, Pam, I'll give you two more minutes. So that's, that's perfect. perfect. Um, all right, good. Then I'm, I will use my two minutes. Well, um, all right. So we've already talked about a bunch of use cases. We've talked about skim is provisioning API, skim is database. Um, and my assumption with the skim is database is that that's, you know, where we would discuss uh, the filtering and querying specifically. Now, um, and then we've, so the group management. Yeah, I, I don't think filtering and querying is the issue. I think filtering and querying has been the hook that people are looking to skim saying this is, this is, why they want to use skim to extend it for other purposes because the way it works with json documents uh is very powerful because you get a full query engine okay it's so not, so then it's not it it's not a, so then i guess I don't it's not a deliverable a reason why <laughs> okay but how we need to capture that into the use cases right so i think what you're um, saying is that there's a searching and querying use case that we're searching I, and querying is the the lead hook I think I would put it this way. It's, 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 um, the use cases, uh, uh, other identity objects, um, uh, or other data and other data. Um, and, and the preface of the reason for is, 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 uh, the utility of, of skims, JSON schema and JSON filter mechanism. Okay. Uh, so the next question is, do, I mean, if our goal here is for people to look at this use cases and concepts document and say, I see my use case in here, then we might want to reflect some of the personas that we see. So if, and if that is the case, we might want to, you know, the, the, sort of the three different kinds of applications that tend to get skim enabled as far as I know are you know, SaaS apps, right? So if, if you're a developer who's got a SaaS app and you want to skim enable it because that's what's going to let you get to your cloud platforms, uh, that's one. Another one is on, you know, is um, enterprise applications, right? That that are not SaaS apps, right? That are single tenant applications um, that are sort of last mile integrations. And then the third one would be cloud platforms. Does anyone think those should be three separate cases? Okay. I must say, I'm, not, I'm a fan of it. Um, the only thing I'll, I, the reason I'm saying that is I look at endpoints as, end, you know, they're endpoints, right? Yeah. And okay. the, uh, as long as, we, as long as we scope this to an endpoint, I think probably we handle all the use cases together. Okay, um, and so, and then I, I know I'm running out of time. So the last one is, um, I believe that the industry has um, agreed upon a term of just-in-time provisioning. 
And that while that that term is not used in RFC 7642, I think it describes some of the SSO use cases in 7642. So does anyone object to me? So, you know, I think we do want to address just in time provisioning, uh, but we want to do it using modern uh, terms. Is there any argument or concern with doing that? I'm not sure the RFC editors having gone through whenever I picked up slang from the industry. You get into this uh, loop of. Where is that defined and how are you doing it? Because slang tends to change over time. Just in time has been around for a while and it seems to be self evident. Um, but I think it's so how do you capture. Well, or how do you capture what's the nature of the point? That like you, you described, um. That that the idea is you create an account and it becomes active. That's the actual issue um, behind just in time. So you could define just in time that way and then start using it. I guess. Um, right. It may also be defined in the PAM um, yeah. extension. I'll have to check that. Yeah, it's not. Maybe it, it's not defined there, PAM. But it, I think it's it's relatively easy for us to construct a definition of of just in time. So I, I'm totally supportive of uh, of including it. I also wanted to comment that we should go back to the charter. And, and so while we can update the use cases to as a sort of promotional piece, this is what you can use skim for. One of the reasons I always like as, as a, a spec writer is the use cases guide me as to how to write the spec. Because the, uh, it should be solving the new use case that's there. So we have like event coordination and we need to on the charter and we need to figure out. Okay, does that mean what does that mean and, and come up with the 2 or 3 use cases for that. Um, for that new deliverable, um, and, and also. The use case. One of the problems with the use cases, it doesn't necessarily reflect all the things you can use it for. From a mar I'm going to use marketing. I don't mean to use it in a derogative, derogative sense, but a lot of times to me, the set of use cases you work with as a protocol writer is. These describe the technical things you need to achieve. So. They may not describe everything you can do, but it describes all the. Technical problems you have to achieve for the spec to be acceptable to the to the working group, um, and that might be why, for example, the current seventy six forty two doesn't appear to reflect everything people are doing, but it does reflect everything that the restful protocol needed to achieve. Um, does does that difference make any sense? Yeah, I might I need. Think so. I may need more help. <laughs> well. A RESTful sure protocol, a, a CRUD, a CRUD API. Uh, I can describe five different cases that a CRUD API is useful for, in five different ways I can use it. But I might only need two use cases to describe all the capabilities of create, all the requirements for create, read, update, delete. Right, or I have four cases, even though, so four cases: create, read, update, delete, and then, and then. You, but you can use that API in 10 different ways and you can talk about the 10 different ways or you can focus in on the key case for each function. Okay, that's super helpful. I know I'm out of time. Um, Nancy, are we gonna talk about preferred document um, format for interim documents and GitHub putting things on GitHub? Um, yeah, I mean, until we adopt the documents, um, well, I can try and create a, a, a temporary repository in GitHub until they get adopted. Um, it doesn't matter to me as chair, what format you use, but by the time you want to bring it into a proposal, it should be in the IETF. Template format. Draft format. Okay, so I think we have to agree on what, how we can most easily edit the document. In the meantime. Fair point. Does it does any it, so I don't want to take any more time. I think we could do this on the list. Yes, so I, yes. I'll maybe ask on the list what we whether what we care about. 
Sounds good. All right, so I kind of let it go a little longer. Um, so we can take the, the other logistics on the list too. So we have 15 minutes, Danny and Janelle, for the scheme and protocol discussion. Okay. Um, so first thing, I just want to sort of uh, get a sense for opinion the same way that Pam did for a few things. Um, previously, we've discussed uh, sort of two different paths that could be taken. Um, as far as the, like the, the current state of 7643 and where do we go? There's, um, do we just sort of polish up the existing 7643 and 44, uh, you know, go through the errata, you know, fix small mistakes and try to push them from uh, what is it, proposed standard to an actual standard? Or do we need to do a, you know, a more sweeping set of work than can be encompassed just in, you know, minor fixes? Um, my take just based off of, you know, my, my own perceptions, the discussions that have just happened on use cases, we, probably lean towards the, the latter of those two of uh, a, a more thorough sort of revision of uh, the schema and protocol documents to uh, account for the changes in, uh, you know, just the, the world and the internet in the past, uh, what, what is it, seven years? Uh, does anybody object to, to that path forward for the work? Not only do I not object, but I, I would thoroughly endorse that approach because I think we're, we're going to find that we're going to need to tweak things at both the scheme and the protocol level based on the use cases. I think it's a very good approach. Yeah. And yeah, that's my take as well. It, it, I think if we were trying to limit to just uh, small fixes, it's, it's very limiting on what we can actually accomplish. We do have to remember to change the examples to, uh, to, more neutral, politically correct, because I believe the current ones came from Animal House. I did not know that. Because <laughs> those yeah, I learned this started recently. in Skim One. Yeah. So um I could see Marteza influencing that, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah. Given you can't edit specs existing specs you have to sort of revise them but the, it would be nice to, to to at least change the names yeah uh, i will keep that in mind i'll, vol I'll volunteer mortez's name <laughs> um so yeah beyond um I, like there's no real tangible work that has happened at this point more been like i guess you know review and strategizing between uh janelle and i um so uh, I wanted to run through just sort of a, a rough, uh, like bullet pointed list of things that I'm hoping that we'll accomplish for, uh, I'm not sure if it'll be before March or before uh, July. Um, I, I know in the, uh, in the, uh, God, what's the word? Um, the, the milestones, uh, I think the, the, the like, date for the actual deliverable of like something on 76, 43 and 44, or, you know, I'll just call them scheme and protocol would be July, but uh, the the rough list of things that I hope to have accomplished before, whatever they need to be delivered, would be uh, that we compile a list of areas that need review to see if they've ever been implemented. So, you know, go through paper cuts, see if there's anything that might need to be removed from the standard moving forward. Um, expanding on examples provided for certain operations. Um, there's a few areas in the protocol documents, especially where uh, slightly different, you know, formats or syntaxes are given for examples um, w when it comes to say uh, doing an add versus a replace or a remove, and uh, it leaves sort of a gray area of interpretation where you know perhaps you can just change the patch op from add to remove, and do the you know the, the same like analogous uh, operation. But then people who are leading, reading it as sort of as, uh, as literalists, they say, no, you have to only remove in this format. And it, it creates a whole lot of uh, bad situations for compatibility between client and uh, server. Yeah. Um, and then um, there's been a couple different proposals, uh, some for me, um, about uh, extensions to uh, you know, perhaps uh, extension uh, schema proposals to Skim 2.0 for, um, you know, I, I propose roles and entitlements uh, and domains, and then there's discussion on, say, devices. Um, I would like to get a broader consensus on how 
to uh, approach that. Um, I know, uh, Phil, uh, you've mentioned in the past um, that perhaps like the roles and entitlements resource types could be folded into the core schema eventually. Um, I personally have a, a taste of perhaps um, initially publishing some of these that um, there's sort of like industry appetite for now uh, as extensions to 2.0. And then uh, since we're uh, probably several years away from you know 2.1 or 3.0 or whatever we end up um, if with a with a heavy re re yeah, revision of the schema and protocol docs, uh, I, I would like to uh, at least explore um, you know publishing some of these extensions uh, or you know publishing some of these schemas as extensions to 2.0, and then later we can evaluate also just folding them into the core of whatever the, the newer edition is. Um, Danny, I, I, I'd like to second the work on roles. Um, I've had a long-standing concern with groups. Groups work well when you have 100,000 people or less. And I get very concerned about privacy problems of identifying groups of people and what they're being used for in very large scale. And the other problem I've heard of is that once you get a, a membership rate that's so high, your change rate on that group resource is so high that it, it's really, it's hard to replicate it, it's hard to repeat it, it's hard to have control and, and deal with conflicts, that it, it it seems to be a poor way to scale things. And it, it because it's a relational structure, because you now have, you could have 10 million objects, each with a referential concern, which is great, but Skim has stable identifiers and we reference with these stable identifiers, but it's still at scale a concern. And I always like to see um, roles against user objects. So if you really are a privileged entity, you can query all the user objects with that role at scale, maybe with Hadoop or something, and you're doing data analysis on a Skim repository, you import it into Hadoop and you do it that way. But I'd rather see entitlements managed on the actual security resource rather than grouping resources, um, just because of the, 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 it reduces the number of collisions between entities trying to write the skim. Um, and it makes it easier to, to implement skim. I think that's skim's biggest problem is um, groups having multiple uh, threads writing to the group at the same time and creating conflicts Whereas if you go back to the user object, it's just easier to, 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 to deal with those conflicts when it's against each object. Yeah. Phil has this role. Did, uh, is that clear? Yes, I think. And, I'll say. And, and like from, from my experience, um, sort of representing uh, Microsoft's GIM client, uh, we, we've got a lot of bubble gum and duct tape helping us to work with, with groups. Uh, because past a certain point, you know, when you get 500,000 or a million members of a group. It's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, have, I have a question regarding um, a continuation of your conversation, Phil, on roles, which I think is a really interesting approach as well. Um, one of the things that, you know, is lovely about, you know, certain types of groups uh, concepts in the past was, um, you know, calculated groups in the form of dynamic groups that we talk about them and and all that systems and, and the same similar type of thing could be applied here with a role like user has these five attributes that composes a role or or something of that nature which would be interesting to expand upon those thoughts if we're considering roles there's i've just been doing a, a survey for a client on the various different platforms and roles itself is extremely poorly defined because you have on the identity provider side you have roles that get expressed i'll call it the database level or the directory level where it comes from uh, there's a role object attached to the person and it says you have these entitlements um, you have oauth itself if on the authenticating device attaching roles based on conditions you have a proxy attaching roles, and then you're going, well, where do those roles get consumed? Um, again, you have another proxy 
and you have the application and you have a policy decision system talking about notions of entitlement and groups of entitlements done in roles, but no two vendors does it the same. So if you're an enterprise and you're trying to build security based on roles, even roles is uh, a huge problem in the industry and it would be nice to define, um, to clearly define the flow for ABAC and RBAC. And I'm not sure, we have to be careful here because it's sort of not in the scope for our work group, but I mentioned it because SKIM is the first source for that information often, um, or either the first source in the originating identity provider or the last source in the application endpoint uh, where it has its, its pre-provisioned users and it's deciding uh, uh, which roles have been assigned to the user in the applications context. Um, and describing that use case might be useful to, so we could talk about roles that originate in the IDP and roles that are being uh, attached to that authenticated subject in the applications context because it's it's been pre-provisioned in the app. Uh, that might be a good use case to talk through. Yeah, I think row is very sensitive information, also very useful, right? In a different system, we define different roles. I was, uh, I had to take a quick look at Daniel's back. I think the, the role definition also, I think the type was uh, used to uh, indicating the capability. Uh, but since all different system has different definition, I was wondering is they, can we define some common type at least to so people can share those things so we know your map your your this type of role map to our type of role see basically to to see if we find a way to de, uh, to determine interoperability or interchangeable uh, definition roles among system I think it's something we will be interested to find it out. Actually, that's a great question for um, for some people who have been involved in the security area for a really long time. Um, and uh, Nancy, actually, you may have some insight here. Is there a definition of a role that we can borrow from one of the other from, from other work that 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 seems suitable to you? I'm I'm trying to think. Um, I don't know that there's a standard semantic definition of roles that could be used. The closest ones may be, you know, what was done in Active Directory or LDAP as examples. Um, but even that, I would say, uh, needs to be modernized. I would leave it at that. I think the older definitions may not work. I think we do need a definition of, uh, I'll call it a role, role flow or role workflow because That's, roles yeah. can be inferred at multiple. We now have a distributed it's authentication a, yeah. system. Right. And that's why I say it needs to be modernized, Phil, from, from yeah. that perspective. Um, I can't even describe the about, problem. Yeah, are we talking about modernizing the syntactics or the semantics? The semantics. Okay, because you know the, the fact that roles have just been strings has been, you know, is in, in some ways one of the better interoperability um, characteristics, right? So, so we're not talking about making roles into complex objects or anything like that, right? Well, the problem, the problem is, um, is having a common understanding of uh, purpose and use. Um, as I can tell you that what Azure does what Google does, what Amazon does just off the top is completely different models, which yeah. makes building policy across those systems very, very hard. If you're trying to centralize the policy and say, here's my running app, it's sitting on two or all three platforms, and I can't tell what's going on because the policy language is completely different. Right. And, well, um, I, I will note that um, policy is outside of our charter. Yeah. The definition of a role should be semantically consistent, 
right? And so I think your original point of defining a, a, the semantic interpretation of a role is useful. Um, providing the use cases of how the roles gets used, because you're noting rightly so, that they do get used in different models and potentially workflows, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And right. yeah, I want to be careful not to, yeah, for us, we're driving, the key is that the role is the data that feeds these systems. Not That's, not, that's what I want to distinguish, yeah. Okay, with that, I want to be respectful of time because I'm I'm one minute over with this, but I, I didn't want to stop because this was a good discussion. Um, I do encourage you guys to, to keep the chatter because I noticed not much has happened on the Slack channels. <laughs> and so um, we should continue this discussion because I think we're, we're making good progress with respect to getting alignment and direction for the work that needs to be done, right? Um, that said, I'm looking at the timelines for ITF 113. If we think we we can, so I'm I'm kind of putting work in into the 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 pen holders, the editors for the different drafts. The deadline for submitting a draft, a zero zero draft, um, prior to IETF 13, is March 7th. Um, we could hold another virtual interim. Uh, which is currently scheduled for March 2nd, right? So it's, it gives you a few days before the draft deadline and it gives us a couple of weeks before um, the actual IETF 113 session. Um, thoughts? Let me just put the question. Um, do you want to have another virtual session on March 2nd? I, I'm I'm in favor of it. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I, I see a couple of hands on WebEx. Yay. <laughs> okay, so we'll go ahead and and um keep the uh the March second then. Um but do continue conversations, you know, either on the mail list or on, on the Slack channel. And um we'll go through there. And then Pam, if you want, I, I can open, we didn't close on it, but um, I had originally stated that the GitHub that I would create would only be for adopted working documents. But if you wanted to, um, I can still create a skim working group repo there and then just have a, a subfolder within there that says these are not adopted yet, something like that. I, I mean, I think we could actually do a lot of this editing in Hedgehog. Could we not? Is that a horrible idea? Ah, I mean, if we can me. take, if we can do this in Markdown. Yep. I mean, I don't recommend Hedgehog for this because things tend to get lost there. It's a dumping ground and, and with, with very poor organization. Okay, we'll take it to the list and see what people think. Okay. We have options. I, I do think centralizing somewhere is a good idea. Like all of us having our own repos and sharing that would get very complex too. So if we could centralize somewhere, that'd be great. Okay. So I'll take the action of, of um, I was waiting until we had documents, but um, I will just go ahead and, and take the action in creating the repo. Um, but then as to how you want to do the formats, right? I think that's up to you prior to the bringing it formally to the ITF, that is. Okay, that said, I'm now five minutes over. Unless there's any other pressing needs, I can let you guys go, going once, going twice. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Nancy. Thanks, everyone.